I wanted to ask, uh, what brings you guys out uh, to this rally? What are you advocating for? Or what is um, what brings you to here? I guess uh, protecting our civil rights mm -hmm. is the biggest thing. So I see a lot of misguided, ill-informed people out trying to spread a message that just isn't true. And it gets frustrating at a certain point. You got to go out and do something about it. And even just coming out here and showing that there's a lot of people that support the Second Amendment in what the Constitution guarantees us as an individual right. I think that's important to show. Yeah, I think it's important to show. I think because uh, you see a lot of the anti-gun protests coming exactly. out there, right? So yep. it's kind of good to show like a good positive pro-freedom, I would say. Exactly. Uh, towards that, it's funny like they always bring up examples of like uh, Australia or Britain, but these yeah. are not like gun cultures, you can say, exactly. right? Exactly. Australia yep. was set up as that's a penal an colony. Point. Right. That's, exactly. that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so we're, okay. we're citi it's it's overused, but we're citizens. We're not subjects. Right. And that's a, it. May seem like a small difference, but it's huge in in our mindset and how we view freedom right what do you think of um, even when the arguments used for the Second Amendment right because it's an amendment you have additional amendments you even had an amendment that was repealed once uh, mm -hmm. for prohibition yeah right I think that was like the 19th Amendment um, so you can see though that they can repeal amendments right, right? Uh, don't you think that perhaps then our right then to defend ourselves uh, goes even further beyond the Constitution. It does. It does. Um, and the Constitution just guarantees the rights that are already um, in place from God, given right, to all people. Right. These mm -hmm. are inalienable rights. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. So, like uh, the natural right to defend yourself from those who seek to aggress you yep. uh, comes. Uh, from, from a natural right or from God, but regardless of what government says, that's, right, correct. that's a natural human right. Exactly. Cool, okay, that, that's something like I always want to see to make sure like, uh, like we're on the same page with that. So yes. even if like liberals try to repeal it or push forward for that, um, that's not really still an argument for us to like, well, you know, okay, they wrote it on a piece of paper, they legislated it away, we must yeah. therefore now turn them that's over. That's very true, right? very true. Because uh, mm -hmm. I've seen like in some videos in Katrina where the military actually went and confiscated guns. Mm -hmm. um, so, so some people say it might not happen, but there has been some examples. Well, even if Waco. you look in- uh, Waco? Waco, Texas. Waco, they tried Texas. to take it away. They tried to take it away. As recently as the past couple of years in New York as they've changed laws on magazine possession is one example. Uh, there's a community outside of Chicago that just outlawed assault weapons. Yeah, and it's an individual community enforcing it. And yeah. they, it's gonna go up against the Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah I think there's a Supreme Court ruling recently that said like uh, uh, AR, uh, rifle, is uh, unconstitutional. It's not uh, included as uh, part of your the Second Amendment. Now, now that wasn't a Supreme Court, oh, yeah, that okay. was a lower court. A lower court. Okay. Um, and you know, all those will end up getting elevated eventually to right. the Supreme Court. Because if you go back, uh, you got to go back to the 30s to get, there's really two big Supreme Court decisions that have affected uh, Second Amendment interpretation. Mm -hmm. And the first one was against sawed-off shotguns. And the reason that sawed-off shotguns were allowed to be regulated uh, and made largely illegal was they were a non-military type weapon. That there was no justification for them use, for their use in military uh, activities. Yeah, and the original intent, any of the founding fathers, the original intent is for the, every individual civilian to be armed as well or better than the average infantry. That is the original intent of it, and that's why sawed-off shotguns and um, there was another one, uh, the semi-auto shotguns in turning mid '80s. Um, like street sweepers. That's why those were also allowed because they fell under destructive devices and they weren't military weapons. And that's why they were able to limit those. Right. Yeah, I remember reading something about like even the AR rifle was uh, for, on sale for civilians two years before the military started adopting them. Right, right. But that was probably just in, in the acquisition process, yeah. the slow acquisition <laughs> process. But um, just trying to, to pull out ARs or anything like that as something different. Most of it comes from a misunderstanding of it. Right. If you look at actual statistics, you're more likely to be beat to death with a baseball bat than right. killed with an assault or rifle. a hammer. Yep. Or exactly. Or bare hands. More than twice yep. as likely to be beaten to death with somebody's bare hands than right. any rifle, any hunting rifle, AR, lever gun, anything. Right. Uh, or uh, in a car wreck, right? Yep. Right. So we uh, legislate that uh, everyone drive 50 miles per hour if it will solely save one life. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly it. And another thing that draws us out is there's so much misinformation out there about so many things. Um, and I, I really think it's the anti-gun people. Um, why do they have to misrepresent their case so badly if what they're saying is true? Right. Uh, and you go after 
why are they going after assault rifles instead of handguns? Now, I don't think handguns should be regulated either, but handguns are the ones that are involved in the exactly. vast majority of, of murders. Virginia Tech, that was a handgun. It was. Right. It was. Um, so why are they disingenuous about that part? They misrepresent what an assault rifle is, and I mean, in so many ways. They can't even define uh, what, what makes it an assault rifle. Well, yeah. and that's the thing, and that's where I think some of the pro-gun people miss the ticket, is assault rifles have a definition. There is such a thing as an assault rifle. And in America, assault rifles are highly regulated because an assault rifle, by its original definition, is select fire, so it's fully automatic. Mm -hmm. And fully automatic weapons are extremely regulated right. in America. Um, so if they're not willing to understand what they're trying to regulate, I, I think they disqualify themselves from actually trying to solve the problem. They're right. not trying to solve the problem, they're trying to push an agenda, right. which mostly, is unfortunate. Uh, feels, right? It looks scary, they can exactly. say, right? Yeah. Like that one uh, news reporter who was like, oh my god, I think I got PTSD firing a M16 machine gun rifle or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, it, unfortunately, it kills the open conversation. Right. We need that civil debate in our society. And when you start bringing out uh, fallacies and uh, trying to represent pro-gun people, they give a, a, a false choice. Either you're in, for gun control or you're for killing kids in schools. Right. And that's absolutely false. Everybody here, I'll guarantee you, wants to see fewer shootings, wants to see kids survive in school and not have to face that. It's just how we see addressing that problem is categorically different. Right. Um, I like to think that the, the pro-gun uh, people have logic in their argument and we have statistics to back what we're saying and we have reality and um, I just wish that open debate could happen, that civil debate, um, but we're vilified. The NRA being vilified as the gun lobby. No, it's the gun owners lobby. If you look at who funds the NRA, it's not the gun makers. It's primarily the membership, the four million people who are members of the NRA. Like I mean, that one member that stopped uh, the killer at the church shooting in Texas, right? Example. Yeah, never, they never talk about that. Yep. They say, if they say like the NRA kills people, yeah, they killed a, you know, would be a, a murder. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exactly. And, and then you get such a uneven portrayal of what happens uh, in the media. And I hate to come back to the media because, you know, everybody thinks you're you know, a wacko if you say the media is inaccurate, right. but they're horribly inaccurate. They, they won't show cases where guns are used to defend people. They won't show, um, you know, cases where a uh, uh, an armed guy in a in a school, the police officer sat there, killed the the gunman that came in before he could kill a bunch I of think kids. That happened in uh, Maryland. Yep, yeah. exactly, yeah, right. exactly. Um, you get such an uneven portrayal. The average person out there who the Second Amendment's a, a secondary thought only gets that negative gun input all the time. Right. Uh, it's unfortunate. What do you think of? Um so they say this is something to prevent government tyranny, right? To kind of arm yourself in the event yeah. that the government becomes tyrannical. Yeah. Um, how would you find then such a movement? When does government become tyrannical? That's a, a really hard question to answer. And there's no single answer. Right. Um, and it's not, a, it's, if you look historically, it's almost never a single act. It's a, a process. It's little steps, different kinds of uh, legislation against guns, you could say, that builds up over time. Well, and guns are only part of it. Right. I mean, and this is an often used reference, but Hitler was elected. Right. Now, he wasn't, how he gained presidency is a little little screwy, but it was through a democratic exactly. process. Right. Um, so you've got to watch that all the time. And when that, when that red line's crossed, you know, who's to say? Right. Uh, but if you are a subject and you don't have the ability to influence that after that red line's crossed, I mean, what do you do at that point? Right. Mm -hmm. Would you say then, um, perhaps then the Constitution can't even prevent such a tyranny? Right. So we look at the Constitution to limit the size and scope of government, mm -hmm. and we look to where it is today. Mm -hmm. Right. Over 200 bases. You have uh, what Obama will call collateral damage, but those are still drone bombing attacks that mm -hmm. kill the lives of peaceful people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, thousands of people in cages, in jails, prisons for victimless crimes. You know these mm -hmm. things kind of add up over time. You know. So like like you said, like well, what point is that line crossed to say that this is government tyranny? Right. Um, well, and that's that's where the framers of the Constitution were incredible because they established that mechanism, that framework, so you can 
work through those issues as they rise in your society and you deal with it as a republic. You deal with them and uh, figure out and the balance of uh, the three elements of government, you know, between the judiciary, the executive, and um, the in Congress, the elected. <laughs> Um, the, the balance of those three working through those problems because the problems we have today they have similarities to ones previous in our history but they had problems that were unique to them at the time and you have to have a structure that allows the people to govern, govern themselves to solve those problems. Do you think we can, uh, Virginians can govern themselves without a federal government? <laughs> <laughs> you know that that question was brought up uh, what about a hundred and some years ago, 130 right. years ago, yeah. and it, it didn't end up very well. It ended up pretty well. No, right? no. Um, I think uh, inevitably secession is inevitable. Uh, an empire this size inevitably collapses with uh, uh, the weight of its own bureaucracy. Right, right. Yep. The, the dollar losing 97 percent of its value. We see this kind of happening in Europe right now. Uh, USSR eventually collapsed, but doesn't mean that it was a bloody civil war, right? It was a peaceful system. Right, and that's the real key, right. is to have that civil discord between both sides where you can work through these issues without it coming to arms. Right. And that's where uh, we're at a very dangerous time because there's a lot of people in power who build their power through, uh, you know, pushing this discord, um, who, you know, create argument, create divides between races, between classes, between parties. Um, and America's not about that. America's about us all coming together. Um, the flag, there's one of the flags here, this this white yes, one sir. here, yeah. Join our where it shows if you're separated, you're vulnerable. And that was true against the British, and that's true today. You know, as a people, we need to come together. We need to figure out where we agree on things, where we can move forward on things, not focus on where we're separate and different and between the media and and I'll blame the left although the there's elements on the right that do the same thing that emphasize that the divide we can't we have to emphasize how we can come together and solve those problems before it gets to that arms conflict because if you've ever seen a place where there's armed conflict it's not a good thing and it usually does not end up well for a long time. I think uh, the issues in Virginia are a lot different than the issues in California though, right? That's so true. I think like here we can kind of unite, yep. but in a way where if it ever does come to gun confiscation, right? I guess the question is like, would you be like a loyalist to the British? Right, or would you be uh, Virginia first? Yeah. Right, uh, would you? Uh, well, I would, I would say an American right? first. American first, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, because yeah, that part is anti-American to start coming for the guns, you could say. Well, and that's it, and it's a choice every individual would have to make at that time, but it's a dangerous thing, and that's one thing, um, you know, I don't think the left truly understands how visceral that is in America. Um, I don't think they understand the history behind that, and the, the first revolution was started because of gun confiscation. Right. <laughs> that was the straw that broke the camel's back. It wasn't right. everything. The Civil War. I mean, a lot of that was of arms, trying to confiscate arms or make arms unavailable to the other element. Right. And not the overall thing of the Civil War, but what actually, you know, got bullets flying. Right. Uh, Lincoln said it'll come for tariffs and imports. Come for the for the taxes from the south, right? Yep. Uh, so, in terms of taxes um, and, and all this stuff, what what do you, what do you, what's your position on taxation? Do you believe taxation is a uh, theft? Do you think it's uh, unjust no, taking the property? I think it's it's a uh, required part of government. The trick is, and the re the real key is that you can't let taxation get to the point where it's oppressive in and of itself. Um, I think we're well past that I think point. we're past that part. <laughs> yeah. I think that goes under the threshold on uh, tyranny. Nearly half your income, right, yep. uh, taken away. Uh, well, and it's not only that part, it's that, what, 47% of Americans don't pay a federal income tax? Right. Um, you know, I, I do not see it as just me paying for somebody else not to work. I, I think at that point, uh, when we look at defining taxation, right, mm -hmm. uh, like we define theft of like, uh, taking someone's property without their consent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in our relationship with government, although there is, you could say there's a constitution, but it's not like an explicit contract where I have signed my name on it to say, you know, these are good terms, right? Um, mm -hmm. So the relationship with government, there's no contractual relationship. So they can define the terms at any time they want, yep. right? And that's what, that's what ends up happening. It becomes income uh, Well, when tax. government is a separate entity from the people, 
But when the people are the government, which is the entire concept of the United States, um, that's the people defining that. Unfortunately, we've gone beyond that point, and it's not the people defining that. It's a professional class of politicians. It's a professional class, right. Yep. Uh, what do you think then, uh, as this continues to get worse, I mean, there's, there's a good pushback, right? Mm -hmm. But inevitably, I, I do foresee more of a secession going on. Mm -hmm. um, but even if people say if there might be a war, you know, I mm -hmm. wouldn't say uh, the left would much, you know, do a good job in fighting with that back, right? You know, people, you find the reporters saying they have PTSD and you have like a lot of uh, the counties or the states are kind of mostly red and a lot of gun ownerships are of uh, the right side are Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think then um, abolishing then such a government that does try to come for your guns or for your rights or tries to uh, mitigate them or legislate them away? I would lean more towards changing the government. Changing the government? Yeah. At what point do you think that change is, is impossible? That's, and it's, it's like that Charlie Brown episode, yeah. like the whole of the football, like, yeah, this will change. Yeah. One more legislation, one more reform. Yeah. When all the past several decades of them just hasn't worked. That's, and that's that, that red line that you're going to have to recognize then, because I'll tell you, once you cross that red line, the how horrific it is on the other side, uh, the vast majority of Americans do not understand, and we don't want to go there. I think we did a pretty good job at the Bundy Ranch. Uh, I mean, not we, but like, you know, people uh, came out there for the argument of property rights. Right. Right. Uh, and that was a much stronger argument than what the government was presenting itself. Yeah. And that's why that uh, backed down. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had people who actually had rifles pointed at government agents for the first mm -hmm. time, I think, without being fired back upon. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think the more argument of property rights won through that day and standing mm -hmm. off government. And I think uh, perhaps it doesn't necessarily have to be that violent. I think government wins if they have if they can twist the argument around to make them look like the good side, like the good guys. Mm -hmm. um, and they well, everybody thinks they're the good guy. Everybody will try. Yeah, yeah. They, I, I think the vast majority of people believe they are the good guy and that their opinion is the right and what's going to help people. That's again, I'll come back to social discourse, and that's why that's so important. One last uh, question I want to ask. Uh, sure. um, what do you think then that government really can't protect your life, liberty, or property? Uh, and that there's not just Supreme Court mm -hmm. rulers that said that there is no obligation for the police or government to do so, but mm -hmm. the case in uh, the Parkland High School where there was a sheriff, four sheriffs, mm -hmm. that hid and then actually engaged the shooters, yep. right? Uh, showcased that there is no obligation, there is no duty. I mean, there was that Maryland uh, case that just happened, sure, but mm -hmm. uh, in general, there is no obligation. I think it's an inherent part of government to play a role in your protection, like. Um, large scale military. Large scale that's, military. That's the, protecting against nation on nation conflict, against external terrorists, uh, policing, general policing. But that does not absolve me as an individual of my right and responsibility to protect myself and those around me, my yeah, family. It's the same reason I have a fire extinguisher at home. I'm not going to defund the volunteer fire department. I'm going to not rely on them entirely and try to use the fire extinguisher and call them and mitigate that threat until they show up. Same thing with the police force. They made a good point. I'm not, not going to defund the police force just because they don't all do their job all right. I'm still going to call them, but, you know, at that first when seconds count, I'm going to go with the fire extinguisher or the shotgun in my closet. All right, so you made a good point. The fire department is volunteer, right? Or, it's privately, uh, over like 75% of it is volunteer, right? Private charity is going to help this sort of. Do you think that private charities or volunteer malicious group or security could do a much better job than uh, a local government agency that so yeah, kind of takes, think, looks after themselves first? I think that's an interesting point because it, the membership is volunteer, right. but the county I'm from, the they still get their local funding from the local government. Right, there, there's, there's some yeah, uh, there, overlap. Yeah. There is. So it's not entirely. And in cities, you can't really do all volunteer. So in different areas, different things work better. Um, and I think the ex either extreme of we need to get rid of all cops and go all independent or you can't have VDOT and it should all be private roads. I think those extremes are bad, but also the extremes of the only armed people should be cops, I think is also bad. So it's it's where that middle ground is and you need to be able to talk with your fellow citizens openly and listen to each other so you can find that middle ground. Because an extreme on either side is bad.
But you acknowledge that the market forces have been shown to work. Yes. Right. Um, and I think that maybe we give too much credit to government as maybe being our salvation to our problems instead of that. right. Instead yeah. of looking inward in our community and finding solutions to this ourselves, right? Yeah. Which would be much more immediate, much more efficient than waiting for a bureaucracy, you know, to come in Congress for 110 days a year uh, and trying to solve our problems ourselves, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, there are select areas where it, there's an inherent government responsibility. The military, in my mind, is, is one of the clearest ones of those. Um, but there are, that's a very, it's a very select group of areas where the government should do that. They shouldn't be regulating our health care. They should be taking care of those, those core government responsibilities that have been tr held true throughout history. I mean, we're not making this stuff up as new. It's been there a long time. It's, it's all the stuff we're adding to government now that will build that bureaucracy that will right. cave in on us and, and collapse our country. In terms of like military though, um, I find it difficult to justify like their involvement overseas right now, right? Like uh, there is no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Bush needlessly sent them to uh, to Iraq. Um, most of the hijackers were um, Saudi Arabian, right? Yeah. I don't know what, what they're doing in uh, Afghanistan. I think uh, now they're an interesting engagement into a uh, war right now with Syria, yeah. right? And I think these are like the same things that we were hearing from Hillary that a lot of people didn't want to have that kind of engagement, and now we're seemingly. Uh, involving the military again once more in something that's not really safeguarding our freedoms. I think it's here where we're losing them and not overseas. It's it's both. You can't become isolationist. We tried isolationism after World War One, and because we stepped into the world theater, and then we're like, nope, we're we helped, and then we're out. You can't entirely go back to isolationists. We are yeah. part of the world. How the world works. One of the most influential countries in the world. I'd say we are the most culturally influential, influenceable country in the world. Yeah. And we can't step back from that. Now, are we a little too far into being the world's police force? Maybe. There, there, there's room. Yeah. There's got to be a clear uh, American interest before we put boots on the ground anywhere. Afghanistan. Okay, you raised Afghanistan. Yeah. The reason we went into Afghanistan was that the terrorist organizations had free reign there so they could organize, they could plan, they could recruit, they could train. They had an area there that was welcome to them to do that. And we had to end that. We had to make that area a controlled area, not necessarily by us. I mean, that's how we worked it, but the answer is to keep it from being a permissive environment for those bad guys to, to do that. Um, so in my mind, Afghanistan was, in its early years, was a very clear case. Now we can argue about Iraq all we want. Yeah, I mean, and you, in some areas, you'd be surprised where you wouldn't get an argument from. Right. Them. But um, again, there's got to be a clear, defined U.S. interest before we use the military in anything. I think there was a there's an interesting case before Afghanistan that. Uh, they had Osama bin Laden, the Taliban was ready to give him up. They had a White House press conference saying, hey, they're ready to give him up, so evidence and they'll hand it over. This is before uh, they started the bombing campaign. Yep. When the bombing campaign occurs, like, okay, we'll give him up to a neutral third country, right, immediately to stop bombing us. But the White House press, you'll find this on YouTube, uh, uh, televised, and they say, yeah, uh, we have no uh, comment on that, you know, so it doesn't seem like if it was the interest was to capture Osama bin Laden. Yeah, I would question the, the validity. Right. Uh, then it seems like some other reason to go into war. You know, there's a lot of money involved yep. in going to war, right? The United States is one of the largest arms sellers in the yeah, world. I know people like to do, like to talk about that yeah. and the military industrial complex and everything. And there are certain aspects of that that are very true. Look at our, our, our military budget yeah. and, and how much of it goes to business rather than production. Right. Um, but the idea of us going to war to make money, you look historically, that doesn't make sense. And I don't think that's what drives it. You have to go back to power. It's power, not money. Now, it's hard to differentiate the two. Uh, but if you look at anything, I'm sure you've seen the movie Wag the Dog. There's a great example. Uh, military intervention has a, has a great way of distracting. Yeah. Um, and then if you see, a, a, on an ideological level, a broader uh, threat, and personally that's why I think we went into Iraq, it was a broader threat, it wasn't just what was in there.
I think uh, if that was a threat, we, we would have gone after Saudi Arabia, right? And 16 out of 17 hijackers were Saudi Arabian, and that seems to be like the but source of... But what does uh, the government do? What does the, the government has a great financial relationship with Saudi Arabia. Sure. Right, so but has gonna... Saudi Arabia as a country ever attacked us? No. Well, that's where the, the, the people were from. Right? Okay, so a handful of individuals. And they right. say that... Uh, you don't go into a country and invade generally. There are exceptions to attack an individual. You attack the structure of the government. Well, and the say, leadership. And, and, I mean, are we freer today from Afghanistan now that they've been uh, bombing two craters? Or mm -hmm. I would say, sorry, say I say we're freer today since bombing Afghanistan into uh, you know series of craters. Yeah, there's all kinds of all other issues, but yeah. but that goes beyond why we went in. And so you don't you don't have a 16-year conflict and be at the same place when you went in. It seems like uh, even though we're still losing, not weird, but the military is still losing ground in Afghanistan. That's weird. Right. Military is yours. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the military, so I would say, like, I don't think it's done much in terms of safeguarding freedoms, right? And that's the purpose of the military, yeah. to uh, safeguard or grant, help us grant more freedoms here, right, from those who seek to threaten it. And I find it to be more a localized threat here than so, uh, overseas. So picture if we hadn't gone into Afghanistan. 9-11 happens. Um, you know, planes hit the towers, all that happens, and we don't do anything. And Osama bin Laden continues to build al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Do you think he would have stopped there? Even, but, right, so we give that, and we do it before the invasion of Afghanistan, then we go to the Taliban offering three times to give up Osama bin Laden. Yeah, right? yeah we, we can go back to mistakes yeah, yeah, yeah. going so, all the so, way so back. So if that's the case, we then can go back to Afghanistan by that point. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, so if, that's, if that was the purpose. Well, and we can go back to, you know, when we helped the Mujahideen fight right, the yeah, Russians. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if it depends how far back in history you want to go. Right. We, we aren't going to go back into the split between India and Pakistan. I mean, all these things that had a huge play in that region. Keep affecting uh, the next series of events and long-term yep. consequences. That's why you almost have to look at... at every engagement with the military and every time you put boots on the ground and go back to that baseline, does this have a direct benefit to the United States? And what are we trying to accomplish? And can we accomplish that task? But well, before to you go the... in, have a clear a goal. So you, you can say, we completed this task and back out. Yeah, and your goal yeah, becomes have, your have a strategy. very clear cut goal. But it seems to be then like government intervention in the Middle East continues to create more problems and we continue to come back in there sure. again, right? Yep. That's so, where redefining your goal is important. Well, that's what I'm saying, like, the intervention of American uh, military might overseas doesn't seem to be working out. It seems like we're causing more problems when we come in return to try to fix that. It depends at which, where you put right. it. He the was Middle mentioning, East. like, World War One. Before World War One, Europe used to be involved in many great wars, and yeah. after they ended, it always became a stalemate, and all the lines went back to where they were. It was the first time, because of American involvement, that there was a clear winner, and now Germany could suffer. Now that's where all the uh, Versailles Treaty and uh, hurting them came to be, because now there was a clear loser. Uh, because of American involvement. Whereas yeah. it could have been a stalemate, it could have been... Well, and even the reason why there's a World War II, I would argue, is because of World War I. American and, involvement in it and... No, not at all. Germany. We didn't have clear goals. We never went into Berlin and established the individual German citizens didn't feel like they had lost the war. Yep. They felt like their yeah. leaders failed them. Yep. And because we didn't go into Berlin, we didn't have that clear goal of foreign policy where it's a deterrent we, they never want to fight us again. We never established that with the German people, and that's why World War II happened, because they felt slighted by their government, mm -hmm. and that the government let them down. You guys and ever hear of uh, Hardcore History? I think it's uh, Carlin's Hardcore History. Mm -hmm. on, Grace, YouTube? on YouTube, yeah. yeah I've, I've seen some of it. Yeah, great series on World War One. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I recommend it. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, I just want to say thanks for you guys uh, coming oh. out here and, and uh, supporting uh, yeah. pro-gun rights. I think we're, that's kind of important. What's going to go up on? Huh? Where, where, where is this going to be? Oh, this going on YouTube. Have, it's, it's independent journalism. I just kind of cool. go online to talk, awesome. to, talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, Take that filter off there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the channel's independent journalism? Yes, yeah, independent okay. journalism. Cool. Um, I'll give you my name afterwards. It's Cal Moloney. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for pushing for gun rights, right? In the face of like the onslaught like in D.C., you had a lot of anti-gun people. And I went there and I asked them, like, what does AR stand for? And they're like, uh, assault rifle, right? Yeah. So a lot of people yeah. don't really know what it is that they're arguing against. Yeah. Um, but it's good to hear, though, even regardless of the Constitution, that your self-defense doesn't really just come from the Second Amendment. It's a natural right yeah. to defend yourself from that. Yeah. So thank you so much, guys. Cool. Yeah, Thanks, have man. a great day. Take care. <laughs>